We now look at our good dead friend Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, starting out with a bit of background. Now, prior to about the 18th century, what we now call Germany, uh, was culturally fairly stagnant. Uh, the common people spoke German, the upper classes spoke French, and the scholars wrote in Latin. Now, why was what we now call Germany, and I say this because the uh, German states were not what we now consider modern Germany, they were divided um, separate uh, states. So Germany, of course, experienced the Protestant Reformation and also the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648. And these are very disruptive to the German states. And during this time period, as far as we know, the German states did not produce any significant philosophical thinkers, again, as far as we know. Now, what about Leibniz himself? Well, he was born in 1646 in Leipzig, Germany. He learned to read Greek and Latin, and he bragged that at age 13, he could read scholastic texts as easily as other people might read a light romance. And again, scholastic text here is not like scholarly text, but a particular school of philosophy, the, you know, the scholastics. He entered the University of Leipzig at 15, graduated at age 17. He studied mathematics, and then he returned to Leipzig to study law, but was blocked in his attempt to get his doctorate. He ended up getting his doctorate in law at age 21 from the University of Altdorf near uh, Nuremberg, which is, Nuremberg, of course, is famous uh, for the post-World War II Nuremberg trials. He was offered a professorship, but decided to become a diplomat and administrator instead. So in terms of his professional career, he wasn't what today we consider a professional philosopher, you know, holding a position at a you know, reputable, accredited academic institution and doing philosophical scholarship. Rather, he worked professionally as a diplomat, and he traveled Europe and met many of the great thinkers of this time period. These include Nicolas Malebranche, who is a French Cartesian a follower of Descartes, Robert Boyle, a, a very famous English chemist, you know, and also uh, Henry Oldenburg, who was a secretary of the Royal Society, and of course our good dead friend Spinoza in Holland before he was Spinoza was dead. In addition to his meeting famous people and engaging in diplomacy and his philosophy, He's also famous for building a calculating machine. So if you ever look at the history of computers, uh, Leibniz will be mentioned because, in part because of this construction of this machine that would mechanically, it wasn't electronic of course, that would add, subtract, extract roots, multiply and divide. And this um, machine earned him membership in the Royal Society, not like Royal Society like in the Royals, but in terms of the actual you know, institution where you know, today it'd be kind of like, well, it still exists today, but it'd be like being in, you know, inducted into like the Hall of Fame in sports. It's kind of a Hall of Fame for science in a way, kind of. Now, most of his philosophical work was not a systematic, you know, sort of professional endeavor one would do to get, you know, tenure or promotion, etc. It's mostly scattered about in letters that he wrote, essays, pamphlets, and unpublished works. So even though he's considered a great philosopher, it wasn't his primary career. So what did he hope to do as a diplomat? Well, he had two major objectives. One was to reunite the Catholic and Protestant churches, because again, going back to the Protestant Reformation, the Catholic church ended up, of course, being split and Protestantism arose, which then split and split and split until now we have many sects of Protestantism. And of course, we also have other uh, Christian religions that are not part of Catholicism because there were splits and divisions that predate the Protestant Reformation. Now, his view was that he'd be able to find theological propositions that Catholics and Protestants accepted and, you know, reunite them. This, of course, did not work out. Uh, we now have, you know, many, many branches of the Protestant faith. Uh, and of course, we still have the Catholic Church. Now, I guess in a way, his plan kind of worked out, although it really can't be given like credit for, you know, this being due to him. 
But it's been a long time since we've had a explicit war between uh, sects of Christianity uh, battling each other over doctrines of the church. So even though we still have you know religious bias uh, in the United States and other countries, uh, clearly, we don't see, for example, in the UK or the US or Australia or Germany or France, we don't see, you know, Protestant churches um, waging war against Catholic churches with actual violence, which uh, I would say is a good thing. So the church is not reunited, so we didn't achieve that goal, but at least they're not killing each other over religious doctrine anymore, so good. Secondly, he hoped to unify the states of Europe into essentially united Europe. How'd that work out? Well, in some ways, Europe did eventually kind of unite a bit. Uh, we, we have um, you know, the European Union, from which, of course, the UK has split and other people talking about splitting. Uh, but it has been a while since European countries went to war. You know, last time, primarily World War II, although we always do have war somewhere in that part of the world, often in former uh, Soviet um, you know, states. And so kind of more unified, and but also still plenty of war. So un Europe uh, still not unified. And although, and of course, there are people who think this unification would be a bad idea. He also had a fight with our good dead friend, Sir Isaac Newton, over who developed the infinitesimal calculus. And apparently Leibniz won that dispute. He ended up dying in 1716, and some stories report that only his secretary was at his funeral. So what are his famous philosophical works? Well, the three big ones are the New Essays Concerning Human Understanding, which are a response to our good dead friend John Locke, the Theodicy, which is titled after the branch of theology, the deals of the problem of evil. If you take uh, the Intro to Philosophy class that I teach, or you take a philosophy religion class, you'll see quite a bit of the problem of evil. And again, the theodicy is the branch trying to solve that problem. And Leibniz is very concerned with that. And as an aside, the problem of evil is, you know, crudely put is this. If God is all good, all powerful, and all knowing, there shouldn't be an evil, but there is. So how do we reconcile God with evil in the world? And Leibniz comes up with various ways of, of doing this, believing he succeeds. His other work is the monadology, which will be our main focus because we're concerned with his metaphysics. And spoiler, I suppose, his view is monads, hence monadology. His methodology is very similar to those adopted by our good friend, dead friends like Descartes and Hobbes, etc very big into logic and mathematics. And like Descartes, he also had great faith in logic. And Descartes, of course, is famous for, you know, Cartesian, you know, geometry. And Leibniz is famous for, well, his math as well. Now, in addition to his, you know, building the calculating machine and doing philosophy stuff, etc., probably his greatest contribution was his discovery that you could take complex mathematical concepts and reduce them to combinations of simpler concepts. And sort of the pinnacle of this is his development of binary mathematics, in which all numbers can be expressed as combinations of zeros and ones. And if you look at um, many of your electronic devices, you'll see that your power button has probably, not always though, but probably has a stylized uh, symbol for zero and a one. You may want, if looking at a closely member, why is that? Well, one means on, zero means, you know, off in terms of uh, circuits, etc. And in logic, of course, we take, you know, true to be one or one to be true and zero to be, you know, false or off. And that's the foundation of modern, um, you know, uh, computers, etc. So really super important development. Now, he believed, argued, that his method of simplifying stuff could extend beyond mathematics, could stand, extend to everything, physics, metaphysics, and law. And we'll see more on this later. So what was he trying to do with all this logic math stuff? 
Well, like our good dead friend Descartes, he wanted to use mathematics and theology to reconcile, you know, science and religion, uh, mechanism and teleology. And so he was working towards a concept of universal harmony. And again, like, you know, our good dead friend Descartes, he wanted to have science, but also religion. He also wanted to have the, you know, the mechanical, you know, physics, but also a purposeful world. He also wanted to reconcile modern philosophy, this say philosophy of his time and ancient philosophy. Much like our good dead friend Descartes, when he was writing his meditations on first philosophy, he kind of begins by saying, you know, the foundations of science and philosophy are just a mess. You know, it's, it's, it's a disaster. And Leibniz has a similar sort of approach and, and he has his own metaphor, not of a foundation, but of a store. And he says that the way science was and in his time was analogous to a well-stocked shop, but without any order or inventory. So a lot of good stuff going on, but it's just all sort of, you know, chaotic. And so not surprisingly, he wanted to address that chaos. So more on his logical method. He believed, much like our good dead friend Descartes, that logic and mathematical methods can yield the method needed to find truth. And he had a great deal of faith in logic. Now, like our good dead friend Galileo, he believed that the universe is a harmonious system and was written in a mathematical language by God. So matter and, well, not for him, not, he doesn't believe in matter, but that is that you have the universe running on math. But he rejects Descartes' view. Why? Well, his main disagreement with Descartes is this. Even though he was influenced by Descartes, you know, likes what, some of what Descartes claims and says, he thinks that Descartes' view will lead one to Spinoza's view. So Descartes is a gateway to Spinoza, and he believes that Spinoza is a gateway to atheism. Now, if you've seen the videos on Spinoza, uh, Spinoza spends all his time arguing that God exists. But he also spends his time arguing that, you know, it's all God. Um, there is one God. That is to say, it's all just God. And critics of Spinoza take the view that well, you could call this whole thing God, but it's nothing like the standard God of Christianity. So in fact, it's atheism, even though Spinoza, Spinoza uses the word God. Now, as I saw earlier, what Leibniz did that sort of inspired him was the discovery about how you can take complex mathematical concepts and bring them down to simple concepts. And again, you know, he developed the binary mathematics. All numbers can be reduced to zeros and ones. And he believed he could extend this, you know, pretty much everywhere. Physics, metaphysics, and law. So how would this work? How would you do this, you know, sort of zero one thing to everything? Well, here's his method. Step one, reduce all concepts into their elementary components. So in the case of geometry, the simples would be figures. Eventually, presumably, you reduce everything down to points and planes. In law, the simples would be actions, promises, sales, etc. And likewise for things like ethics and so on. So the idea is a reduction. You take the complex, reduce it down to the simplest components. Again, going with the, the analogy, just as you, according to him, can reduce numbers all to zeros and ones, all these other things reduced to whatever their corresponding symbols would be. Step two, you would represent all these concepts by mathematical symbols, which form the language of thought. So his assumption here is you could you know, take all these concepts and essentially symbolize them using math. Also a critical assumption is this would actually be the language of thought. And there's quite a bit of debate among philosophers and other thinkers whether there is a language of thought. You know, metaphorically speaking, are we kind of like running a computer language or, or you know, our version of it the same way our computers are literally running, obviously, computer languages or our phones are running a you know, operating system. And so in a way, he's kind of looking for the, I guess, the operating system of the mind. Now, he believed 
that all of our thoughts could be represented by combinations of these symbols. So you could fully symbolize all thoughts. And this would give us the language of thought, or at least the, at least the bits. So we'd end up here with these symbols representing these elementary components. But of course, having, um, to use the analogy, having words is not enough. You need to have rules for combining them, which leads us to step three. This would involve formulating the correct rules for combining the symbols. So the goal here for this particular step is to make the grammar of a symbolic language correspond to the world's logical structure. And going back to our good dead friend Aristotle, this view has you know, been believed by many thinkers, again, going way back. The idea is that our language mirrors or is analogous to the world, and our logic is analogous to the world and our language as well. And so what we wanted to do is find this language that would mirror the world. The logic of the mind is the same as the logic of the world. So why would this be useful? Well, if this worked as he hoped, a true proposition, a true claim, would fit the structure. And false propositions, false claims, would be ungrammatical. So you could work out these rules, have the basic elements, and you could combine stuff and know things a priori, by which combinations you know would be well-formed and which ones would be not well-formed, which would be an incredibly powerful tool where you get to sit down, manipulate symbols, and know truths about the world. And of course, you know, today we would think of, of putting this into a computer, a computer that could run a program generating, you know, the truth. So if you wonder, is this true? You'd run it through the computer program, and it would tell you whether it's true or not. So why would this be useful? Well, <laughs> lots of uses. Leibniz, of course, looked at it in terms of... of from the standpoint of someone who's like a philosopher, uh, as opposed to someone who's looking to, say, make money or oppress people, etc. It would obviously have some pretty um, monetary uses. Obviously, you could really you know, make bank on this if you were the only one that had access to it. You could also use it as a tool of you know, oppression if the state had control of it. But, of course, Leibniz was thinking like a philosopher you know, in terms of the good it could do. So he believed it would permit scientists and philosophers to share a universal language, which has plausibility. I mean, anyone in the world uh, that has learned math, you can communicate with, you know, even if you can't speak their language, you could put like some numbers down and almost everyone knows the basics of, of numbers and math. I mean, it wouldn't be super useful in many ways. Like you couldn't you'd, like produce a math to see like where the bathroom is or something, but it'd be, you could communicate with somebody in a meaningful, you know, way. Similarly, in philosophy, we have logic and every, you know, everyone who does philosophy recognizes those, those symbols. And so we do communicate with, you know, math and logic within limits, of course. Also, as I mentioned before, you could discover new truths just by testing out the combinations within the rules it would be a kind of like a truth machine. If you could automate it with a computer, and Leibniz began to develop kind of an early machine for calculating, you could have a computer for generating truths, which could be the, you know, if you think of like a science fiction story, could be kind of a utopian world where we have the computer that gives us all of these truths, or if it's an episode of something like, you know, Black Mirror or the older Twilight Zone or Outer Limits, then it would be a nightmare scenario. We have a computer that has all of the truths. So it could be utopia or total nightmare, or both. It would also provide us with an objective means of resolving philosophical controversies. So think of like moral disputes over things like, you know, ethical disputes like over whether capital punishment is acceptable, whether abortion is acceptable, uh, whether stem cell research is acceptable. Uh, also, like what would be the you know best political system or debates in politics? Like does trickle down economics work? Uh, would raising the minimum wage cause the troubles people claim? Would it cause the benefits people claim? And you could develop objective answers. You just put it into the run to the calculation, and as long as people are being honest, which is 
probably asking a lot from some people, we would know the answer. We'd be able to say, oh, look, here is the answer to the question of is minimum wage better or worse? Does trickle-down economics work? Does doing tax breaks for the wealthy benefit society? And we'd have all the answers, supposedly. So that would be really useful. Or again, potentially a nightmare depending on how it's used. Now this obviously rests on a wide range of assumptions. First, he assumed that all human thought could be reduced down to these elementary concepts. And obviously there's a question of, is that true or not? Kind of oddly, but maybe not given his great success with binary mathematics, he assumed that this method would be completed in a modest amount of time. Uh, even at a timeline for it of five years for the whole project, provided, to quote him, a few select men worked on it, and about two years to work off metaphysics and morality. And it'd be kind of interesting, you know, kind of like sci-fi story where this actually happened, you know, in which, you know, Leibniz solved all this stuff and maybe there's like a conspiracy to hide it from people. Maybe a good conspiracy because maybe it was determined it would be too horrible and you know, terrifying, or maybe a bad conspiracy, you know, in order to hide the truth. But anyways, he was very ambitious about it, you know, optimistic, and thought it would work out pretty quickly. As far as we know, didn't happen. But again, um, we can't, you know, because of skepticism, we obviously can't say for sure that it didn't happen. So that's kind of the introduction to Leibniz's goal and method. And we will continue and then look at his metaphysical points, his monads. So stay safe, and I'll see you in the future.